Hello, my name is Black Stalker from Chernobylite. Today we are doing great illustrated fairy tales. Today's lesson, Tinkle the Thief. Long, long ago there lived a widow who had three sons. The two eldest were grown up, and though they were known to be idle fellows, some of the neighborhood had given them work to do on account of the respect in which their mother was held. But at the time the story begins, they had both been so careless and idle that their masters had declared that they would keep them no longer. So home they went to their mother and youngest brother, of whom they thought little because he had made himself useful about the house, and looked after the hens and milked the cow. Pinkle, they called him, and by and by Pinkle became his name throughout the village. The two young men thought it was much nicer to live at home and to be idle than to be obligated to do a quantity of disagreeable things that they did not like. Idle they would have stayed until the end of their lives, and not that the widow lost patience with them and said that since they would not look out for work at home, then they must seek it elsewhere, for she would not have them under her roof any longer. We have a nice picture of Pinkel making himself useful. But she repented bitterly of her words when Pinkle told her that he too was old enough to go out into the world, and that when he had made a fortune he would send for his mother to keep house for him. The widow wept many tears at parting from her youngest son, but as she saw that his heart was set upon going with his brothers, she did not try to keep him. So when the young men started off one morning in high spirits, never doubting that work such as they might be willing to do would be had for the asking, as soon as their little store of money was spent. But a very few days of wandering opened their eyes. Nobody seemed to want them, or if they did, the young men declared that they would not be able to undertake all that the farmers or millers or wood carpenters required of them. The youngest brother, Pinkle, who was wiser, would gladly have done some of the work that the others refused, but he was small and slight, and no one thought of offering him any. Therefore, they went from one place to another, living only on the fruit and nuts that they could find in the woods, getting hungrier every day. We have the three young men setting off on their journey. One night, after they had been walking for many hours and were very tired, they came to a lake with an island in the middle of it. From this island streamed a strong light, by which they could see everything almost as clear as if the sun had been shining, and they perceived that, lying half hidden in the rushes, was a boat. <clears throat> Let us take it and row over to the island, where there, where there must be a house, said the eldest brother, and perhaps they will give us food and shelter. And they all got in and rolled across the direction of the light. As they grew near the island, they saw that it came from a golden lantern hanging over the door of a hut, while sweet tinkling music proceeded from some bells attached to the golden horns of a goat which was feeding near the cottage. The young men's hearts rejoiced as they thought that at last they would be able to rest their weary limbs, and they entered the hut, but they were amazed to see an ugly old woman inside, wrapped in a cloak of gold which lighted up the whole house. They looked at each other uneasily as she came forward with her daughter, as they knew by the cloak that this was the famous witch. If you will look closely, you will see the famous witch with her daughter. What do you want? she asked, at the same time signing to her daughter to stir the large pot on the fire. We are hungry and tired, and would have feigned shelter for the night, answered the oldest brother. You cannot get in here, said the witch. But you will find both food and shelter in the palace on the other side of the lake. Take your boat and go, but leave the boy with me. I can find work for him, although something tells me he is quick and cunning and will do me ill. What harm can a poor boy like me do a great witch like you? answered Pinkle. Let me go, I pray you, with my brothers, and I promise never to hurt you. And at last the witch let him go, and he followed his brothers through the boat. The way was further than they thought, and it was morning before they reached the palace. 
Now, at last, their luck seemed to have turned, for while the two eldest were given places in the king's stables, Pinkle was taken as a page to the little prince. Pinkle was clever and an amusing boy, who saw everything that passed under his eyes, and the king noticed this, and often employed them in his own service, which made his brothers very jealous. Things went on in this way for some time, and Pinkle every day rose in the royal favor. At length, the envy of his brothers became so great that they could bear it no longer, and they consulted on how best they might ruin his credit with the king. They did not wish to kill him, though perhaps they would not have been sorry if they heard he was dead, but merely wished to remind him that he was only, a, after all, a child, not half so old and wide as they. Now if you will look, you will see the king with the page, and the prince, and all that good stuff. Their opportunity soon came. It happened to be the king's custom to visit his stables once a week, so that he might see if his horses were being properly cared for. The next time he entered the stables, the two brothers managed to be in the way, and when the king praised the beautiful satin skins of the horses under their charge, and remarked on how different their condition was when his grooms had first come across the lake, the young men at once began to speak of the wonderful light which sprang from the lantern over the hut. The king, who had a passion for collecting the rarest things he could find, fell into the trap directly, and inquired where he might get this marvelous lantern. Send Pinkle for it, sire, they said. It belongs to an old witch, who no doubt came by it in some evil way. But Pinkle has a smooth tongue, and he can get the better of any woman, old or young. <clears throat> then bid him to go this very night, cried the king. And if he brings me the lantern, I will make him one of the chief men about my person. Pinkle was much pleased at the thought of his adventure, and without more ado, he borrowed a little boat which laid moored to the shore, and rowed over to the island at once. It was late by the time he arrived, and almost dark, but he knew that the savory smell that had reached him, that the witch was cooking her supper. He climbed softly onto the roof, and peering, watched till the old woman's back was turned when he quickly drew a handful of salt from his pocket and threw it into the pot. Scarcely had he done this when the witch called her daughter and bade her lift the pot off the fire and put the stew into a dish, as it had been cooking quite long enough and she was hungry. Now if you look, the very jolly king is bidding Pinkle do his work. But no sooner had she tasted it than she put her spoon down and declared to her daughter that someone must have been meddling with it, and it was impossible to eat anything that was all salt. Go down to the spring in the valley and get some water, so that I may prepare a fresh supper, cried she, for I feel half starved. But mother, answered the girl, how can I find a well in this darkness? For you know that the lantern's rays do not reach down there. Well then, take the lantern with you, said the witch, for supper I must have, and there is no water that is nearer. So the girl took upon her pail in one hand, and the golden lantern in the other, and hastened away to the well, followed by Pinkle, who took care to keep out of the ways of the ray. When at last she had stooped to fill her pail at the well, Pinkle pushed her into it, and snatched up the lantern, and hurried back to his boat, and rode off home. For a lovely picture of the unfortunate victim, please zoom in. It was already a long distance from the island when the witch, who wondered what had become of her daughter, went to the door to look for her. Close around the hut was thick darkness, but what was that bobbing light that streamed across the water? The witch's heart sank all at once it flashed upon her what had happened. Is that you, Pinkle? she cried she. The youth answered, Yes, dear mother, it is I. And are you not a knave for robbing me? cried she. Truly, dear mother, I am, replied Pinkle, rowing faster than ever, for he was half afraid that the witch might come after him. But she had no power on the water, and turned angrily into the hut, muttering to herself all the while, Take care, take care, a second time you will not escape me so easily. The sun had not yet risen 
Fingal returned to the palace, and entering the king's chambers, he held up the lantern so that its rays might fall upon the bed. In an instant, the king awoke, and seeing the golden lantern shedding its light upon him, he sprang up, embraced Fingal with joy. O oh, a cunning one, cried he, what treasure hast thou brought me? And calling for his attendants, he ordered that the rooms next to his own should be prepared for Pinkle, and that the youth might enter his presence at any hour. And besides this, he was to have a seat on the council. It may have easily been guessed that all this made the brothers more envious than they were before, and they cast about in their minds afresh how they best might destroy him. At length, they remembered the goat with the golden horns and the bells, and they rejoiced. For, they said, this time the old woman will be on the watch and let him be as clever as he likes, the bells in that horn are sure to warn him. This is Pinkle making his grand escape. He is a clever man, but is very hard to roam. So, when, as before, the king came down to the stables and praised the cleverness of the brothers, the young men told him <clears throat> of the other marvel possessed by the witch, the goat and the golden horns. From this moment, the king never closed his eyes at night for longing after this wonderful creature. He understood it was something of danger that there might be in trying to steal it, now that the witch's suspicions had been aroused, and he spent hours in the making plans for outwitting her. But somehow he could never quite think of anything that would do, and at last the brothers had foreseen, he sent for Pinkle. I hear, he said that the witch on the island has a goat with golden horns, and from which hangs bells that tinkle the sweetest music. That goat I must have, but tell me, how am I to get it? How would I give... I would give the third part of my kingdom to anyone who would bring it to me. I will fetch it to myself, answered Pinkle. This time it was easier for Pinkle to approach the island unseen, as there was no golden lantern to throw its beams over the water. But on the other hand, the goat slipped inside the hut, and they would therefore have to be taken from under the very eyes of the old woman. How was he to do it? All the way across the lake he thought and he thought till at length a plan came into his head which seemed as if it might do, though he knew it would be very difficult to carry out. And if you will bear with me, this is a beautiful picture of a goat with bells. Reminds me of Russia. The very first thing he did when he reached the shores was to look about for a piece of wood. And when he had found it, he hid himself close to the hut, till it grew quite dark and near the hour where the witch and her daughter went to bed. Then he crept up and fixed the wood under the floor, <clears throat> which opened outward in such a manner that the more you tried to shut it, the more firmly it stuck. And this is what would happen when the girl went as usual to bolt the door and make it f all fast for the night. What are you doing? asked the witch as her daughter kept tugging at the handle. There is something in the matter with the door. It won't shut, answered she. Well, leave it. There is nobody to hurt us, said the witch, who was very sleepy. And the girl did as she was bid and went to bed. Very soon they were both heard snoring and Pinkle knew that his time was come. Slipping off his shoes, he stole into the hut on tiptoe and taking from his pocket some food of which the goat was particularly fond, he laid it under his nose. Then, while the animal was eating it, he stuffed each golden bell with wool he had also brought with him, stopping every minute to listen, lest the witch should awaken, and he could find himself changing into some dreadful bird or beast. But the snoring still continued, and it went on with his work as quickly as he could. When the last bell was done, he drew another handful of food out of his pocket and held it out to the goat, which instantly rose. But before we continue, here's a picture of Pinkle being a thief. to its feet and followed Pinkle, who backed slowly to the door, and when directly when he got outside, he seized the goat in his arms and ran down to the place where he had moored his boat. As soon as he reached the middle of the lake, Pinkle took the wool out of the bells, which began to tinkle loudly. Their sound woke the witch, who cried out before, Is that you, Pinkle? Yes, dear mother, it is I, said Pinkle. Have you stolen my golden goat? she asked. Yes, dear mother, I have, answered Pinkle. Are you not a knave, Pinkle? Yes, dear mother, I am, he replied, and the old witch shouted in rage. Ah, beware how you have come hither again, for the next time you shall not escape me. But Pinkle only laughed and rode on. 
The king was so delighted with the goat that he always kept it by his side, night and day, and as he had promised, Pinkel was made ruler over a third part of the kingdom. And as might be supposed, the brothers were more furious than ever, and grew quite thin with rage. Here we are with Pinkel in a boat with a goat. How can we get rid of him? said one to the other, and at length they remembered the golden cloak. He will need to be clever if he is to steal that, they cried with a chuckle. And when the king next came to see his horses, the brothers began to speak of Pinkel and his marvelous cunning, and how he had contrived to steal the lantern and the goat, which nobody else had been able to do. But as he was there, it was a pity he could not have brought away the golden cloak, added they. The golden cloak, what is that? asked the king. The young men described its beauties in such glowing words that the king declared that he should never know a day's happiness till it had wrapped his cloak around his shoulders. And, added he, the man who brings me to it shall wed my daughter and inherit my throne. None can say, get it save Pinkle, said they, for they did not imagine that the witch, after two warnings, could allow the brother to escape a third time. And so Pinkle was sent for, and with a glad heart, he set out. Really quick, here we get the king learning of the golden cloak from the two brothers. They are not the good brothers. Do not be like them. He passed many hours inventing first one plan and then another, till he had a scheme ready for which he thought might prove successful. Thrusting a large bag inside his coat, he pushed off from the shore taking care this time to reach the island in daylight. Having made his boast fast to a tree, he walked up to the hut, hanging his head, and putting on a face that was both sorrowful and ashamed. Is that you, Pinkle? asked the witch when she saw him, her eyes gleaming savagely. Yes, dear mother, it is I. So you have dared, after all you have done, to put yourself in my power, cried she. Well, you shan't escape me this time, and she took down a large knife and began to sharpen it. Oh, dear mother, spare me, shrieked Bingo, falling on his knees, looking wildly about him. Spare you indeed, you thief, where are my lantern and my goat? No, no, there is only one fate for robbers. As she began, brandished the knife in the air so that it glittered in the firelight. If you'll see, we have a lovely picture of that happening. This should be a lesson for all you youngsters thinking of stealing from old women. Not a good idea. They will stab you. Then if I, then if I must die, said Pinko, who at this point was getting really rather frightened, let me at least choose the matter of my death. I am very hungry, for I've had nothing to eat all day. Put some poison, if you like, into the porridge, but at least let me have a good meal before I die. That is not a bad idea, answered the woman. As long as you do die, it is all one to me. And ladling out a large bowl of porridge, she stirred some poisonous herbs into it and set about some work that had to be done. Then, Pinkle hastily poured the contents of the bowl into his bag and made a great noise with his spoon as if he was scraping up the last morsel. Poisoned or not, the porridge is excellent, and I have eaten it. Every scrap. Do give me some more, said Pinkle, turning towards her. Well, you have a fine appetite, young man, answered the witch. However, it is the last time you will ever eat it, so I will give you another bowlful. And rubbing in the poisonous herbs, she poured him out half of what remained, and then went to the window to call her cat. In an instant, Pinkle again emptied the porridge into the bag, and the next minute he rolled on the floor, twisting himself about in agony, uttering loud groans while she, uh, while. Suddenly, he grew silent and lay still. Ah, I thought a second dose of poison might be too much for you, said the witch, looking at him. I warned you what would happen if you came back. I wish that all of these were as dead as you. But why does not my lazy girl bring the wood I sent her for? It will soon be too dark for her to find her way. I suppose I must go and search for her. What a trouble girls are. And she went through the door to see if there were any signs of her daughter, but nothing could be seen of her as heavy rain was falling. It is night, no night for my cloak, she muttered. It would be too covered with mud by the time I got back. So she took off her shoulders, 
hung it carefully on the cupboard in the room, and after she put on her clogs and started to seek her daughter. Directly after the last sound of the clogs had ceased, Pingo jumped up, took down the cloak, and rolled off as fast as he could. And we get to see this shining example of humanity, once again, stealing from an old woman. People call me the bad guy. He had not gone far when a puff of wind unfolded the cloak, and its brightness shed gleams across the water. The witch, who was just entering the forest, turned around that moment and saw the golden rays. She forgot all about her daughter and ran down to the shore, screaming with rage at being outwitted a third time. Is that you, Pinkle? she cried. Yes, dear mother, it is I. Have you taken my golden cloak? Yes, dear mother, I have. Are you not a great knave? Yes, dear, truly, dear mother, I am. And so indeed he was. But at the same time, he carried the golden cloak to the king's palace. And in return, he received the hand of the king's daughters in marriage. People said that it was the bride who ought to have worn the cloak at her wedding feast, but the king was so pleased with it that he would not part from it, and so to, end of, to the end of his life, he was never seen without it. After his death, Pinkle became king, and let us hope that he gave up his bad and thievish ways and ruled his subjects well. As for his brothers, he did not punish them, but he left them in the stables where they grumbled all day long. And we have a lovely picture of this marriage. Now remember, children, the moral of the story is, I guess, thieving is good. Don't, don't take that away. Don't, don't become a thief. It is very bad. Which you should not treat women with respect, treat old women with respect, do not steal from old women, uh, and have a wonderful night.